I think El Salvador is great for families. Our biggest concern was safety. Once yeah. we get over that uh, uh, concern, but once we uh, don't trust but verify, came here, see it for ourselves. Okay, this is safe. We can come with our kids. And everything here in El Salvador is getting better. I've been here only nine months and I am always mind blown of all the different little things that I see improving. It's just incredible how fast this country is improving. We're live here from Bitcoin Beach once again, and we have Francesco with us today. I'm, I'm happy to say uh, we have somebody actually from Europe this time. Lately, we've, it's been a string of uh, Canadian refugees that we've been uh, interviewing, so good to mix it up here a little bit. So tell us, how does an Italian uh, wind up here in El Salvador? Did you come straight here from Europe, or were there stops along the way or what brought you here there were some stops for sure it was not a straight line i was born and raised in rome in italy uh, i lived in uh, germany and norway for a few years and uh, about nine years ago i moved to florida so before coming to el salvador i was actually living in florida and uh, i have been living all over florida from south to north uh, on the east coast mostly yeah with my family and so from there, you just decided to randomly come down to El Salvador or what? Uh, I'm assuming that was intertwined with Bitcoin. And so, yeah, so the the road to El Salvador was uh, very, very interesting, I think, because what happened is that during COVID in 2021, we decided to move back to Europe. That doesn't sound like a very good decision. <laughs> <sighs> that is correct. <laughs> Uh, what happened is that in Florida, my wife and I were living in a nice bubble, you know, filled with uh, common sense. Uh -huh. Meaning, if you're sick, you go to a hospital and you get take care of it, you know, and there was no madness uh, anywhere. So we thought maybe also the, the rest of the world is normal. Uh, there's common sense. So let's go to Europe. We wanted to raise our children in Europe. And our first stop was Portugal. At the beginning, it was fine. And then things start to get a little bit messy because despite us seeing 100% uh, compliance with all the safety and scientific measures to <laughs> contain the problem at that time, cases were spiking up. Things were getting worse. And at the same time, in Florida, where nobody cared, things were fine. There was no zombie apocalypse. And so we start seeing all this weird behavior by the government and also by the people. And at some point, we could not leave our Airbnb. We could not take the kids to a playground. We couldn't do anything. We only had like four hours a day to go to, to buy groceries, which interestingly enough, before the measures, before the lockdown or all this uh, time constrictions that you had on your lifestyle, you would go to shop and it was empty. <laughs> because you spread, I don't know, a thousand yep. people over eight hours or 10 hours a day. But then during COVID, we were all amassed outside in line and had to make videos. This doesn't make any sense. Anyway, we were sick of it and we went to Italy that was reopening at the time where my family is in Rome. Same thing. At the beginning, things are normal. <laughs> and then cases started to go up. Chaos, uh, zombie apocalypse again, nothing makes sense. And I didn't see <laughs> any zombie, but apparently that's the mindset that they had here. And yeah. uh, my wife and I, okay, flew back to Florida and we actually did that the day of my birthday. So my family at the time was asking me, why are you guys escaping? This is your birthday, let's celebrate. I haven't seen you in years no? because I was in the States. So. And we told them, well, you know, mom, you won't understand, we need to go. What happened is that COVID was a good, uh, a wake up call for me. I was just a number, normal person trying to make ends meet. I didn't understand what was happening in the world. And COVID uh, woke me up. And so at the time, the rumor for a mandatory uh, medication to travel to open a flight started circulating. And I talked to my wife and we noticed this pattern that conspiracy theory, 
it actually happened. Yeah. Conspiracy theory, which I thought it was crazy. Over and over and over again. This is happening, yeah. this is happening, this yeah. is happening. And then I start thinking, with a second. If this can happen somewhere, it's definitely in Europe. So just to be safe, we open a flight day on my birthday back to Florida. And the funny thing is that when we landed back in Florida, we felt free again in peace. And my wife and I look at each other and said, you know what? We are not leaving Florida until the world goes back to normal. Uh, 10 months after we were here in El Salvador. <laughs> and, and Europe did lock down again and require the vaccine to travel after that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Complete madness. You guys Lo got locked out down just in everything. Time. Yeah. We got out just on time. And my fear is that because I have an Italian passport, huh? I would have been subject to <laughs> the thing yeah. to fly out. So I, I didn't want to take chances and we just got out. And uh, from there, we went down the rabbit hole of learning how governments are dangerous and you know how you know, the strong people create good times, good times uh, create weak people, weak people create hard times, you know, that's where we are yeah. right now. And uh, hard times then create against strong people. And I went down the rabbit hole of the fourth turning and the sovereign individual. I love that book, the fourth turning, both of those, but the fourth turning especially. I mean, when I was reading it, on, I still remember I was uh, in Florida driving the kids to school back and forth, and I would have, uh, I would feeling, uh, you know, the thrill on my back, or I would have uh, goosebumps. What the hell, this is happening. Well, it's crazy because it was written in the 90s. I mean, it's crazy. It was, it was exactly, and I was trying to understand how is it possible these people were able to predict with such accuracy. What is happening 30 years yeah. after, it's unbelievable. On the timeline that they predicted. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, and then, <laughs> you know, you go down the rabbit hole. And then what happened is that we were in Florida at the time. I was living in uh, Jacksonville, North Florida, and we were next to a naval base. And there were uh, stars in uh, Ukraine, you know, Russia and Ukraine, what's happening? And of course, now I'm getting into this uh, Bitcoiner mindset. Okay, what is going on? Let's try to figure it out. Let's try not to rely on the media because uh, it's it's not been very accurate so far with what I'm experiencing in reality. And so I came across this book, Strategic Relocation, which it was written by two of uh, Navy people or Army people in uh -huh. the United States and pretty much covers all scenario if there is some kind of a bioweapon attack or a nuclear attack or a, uh, economic attack, all these kind of scenarios and where you want to be in the United States. And I was in the worst place possible, according to the book. I was in Florida and I was right next to a nuclear target, the naval base. So what happened is that, okay, let's check out El Salvador because a couple of videos popped up on my YouTube feed. I just watched them just out of curiosity. And the first time we came to El Salvador was just to look for a plan B if things really were going to... <laughs> were, were you guys Bitcoiners at that point or...? At that point, I was still a shitcoiner. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we came to El Salvador as, as a shitcoiner, of course, and... What happened is that we realized that it was actually very nice that our dollars would go a lot farther than in Florida. And we realized, wait a second, this is safe. I'm not saying people murder on the street like you would believe if you listen to the media. And then after like two or three days in our vacation with my wife, we decided, uh, we, we, we actually made up our mind, okay, let's come back here. So we ended up, the we have three or four days left in our exploratory trip to we started checking out real estate land and what or, part of the country were you staying in uh so we were in um, escalon then we went in uh, saragossa then we went uh i think we went in santa tecla and then we went into puerto okay uh, puerto de la libertad i was in a rent an airbnb and as you're being right in the heart of puerto which <laughs> yeah it was a uh, Seems sketchy, but yeah. we felt safe, you know? It was a little bit of Historically, a, that was a very sketchy area, but but these days, everything's kind of cleaned it's up. It's very so. interesting that you say that. Actually, I got lost in a couple of areas in Puerto that people told oh, me- Oh, we wouldn't drive through. I mean, we've been here for 20 years and we wouldn't drive through Puerto at night. Like, that's how bad it was. So wow. we definitely wouldn't have told anybody to stay there. But now it's kind of a different story. Very interesting. Yeah, because people told me, you know what? If you got lost there like a few years ago, <laughs> you would have been in trouble. Anyway, likely things are different now. Yeah. So you spent some time in the city and some time at the beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also in between the city. Yeah. Because I wanted Zaragoza. to check different uh, uh, situation. We checked like uh, 
20 or 22 uh, different rentals. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like uh, I had a pass of a real estate agent, uh, my wife too. So we were really want to check everything and make sure we found a nice place. Let's, uh, I hadn't planned on this, but let's, <laughs> let's do just a, a quick overview of what you guys experienced because you've seen a lot more places than I have. Uh, and people are always asking about rentals. So what would you tell people are the price points and the zones and mm -hmm. the different things for them to think about when they're deciding where in El Salvador they want to move? So I get this question a lot about pricing in El Salvador. And what I tell people is that El Salvador can be as expensive or as affordable as you wish it to be. Depends on your lifestyle, where do you want to be, what you, what you want to do here. So yeah. we have seen from like, very, very expensive uh, high rise luxury towers in Escalon and San Benito for monthly rent. And we have seen like more affordable uh, situations in Santa Tecla. So for, for somebody that's looking for something that say, say they're a family mm -hmm. of four and they want something that's, you know, similar lifestyle to what they experienced in, in Europe or, or the US, something not, not big or huge, but, but something that's comfortable. And so for a family of four, I think you can easily live here comfortably with $2,000 a month and to live oh, a comfortable total. lifestyle. Yeah, total. total life. and, and how much of that would you advise people to, to put aside for rent? Like what's the Oh, uh, depending on your house need, you can find a uh, something decent for thousand dollars or even less mm -hmm. depending on the location uh the, what, what locations did you think provided the most bang for the buck like what areas would so, you suggest people look at here's the thing probably the beach area but then you are giving up the amenities of the city so this yeah. was our struggle at the beginning because we have two kids and in florida we used to take them to rock climbing jujitsu music lessons and uh what else all these things uh and so ideally, initially we were to actually move into the city, but then we realized two things go to my mind, went to our mind is that number one, we don't really like to live in the city. It's very crowded for us. Yeah. And number two, at that time, what if the world goes crazy again? What if there is a lockdown? I don't want to stay in an apartment or in a townhouse. And so that's also why I ended up on the beach because here we could afford, uh, very spacious uh, four bedroom single family home with a pool and a backyard so if there is a lockdown we are fine this was our thinking process and here is something interesting that you said people that come from europe uh find el salvador expensive as a real estate people that come from the united states find it affordable or yeah. cheap that, that's what happens. definitely so it also depends it where depend, you come depend from. what state too if you're coming yes. from california or florida yep. it seems cheap if you're coming from oklahoma i've heard people say like oh it's more expensive, it's expensive. than it was yep. in the u.s so that is um, correct and, and along the beach what would you from 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 what i've seen el zante is probably one of the more expensive places than el tunco but as you get a little further outside of those there's it's more affordable is that what you found or so I think I got in El Salvador still at a good point okay. because I knew prices were increasing. But yeah. I think today from nine months ago, prices have increased even more. So I think we got lucky. We got a lot of house for what we are paying as rental. But what's happening today is that some people are getting aware here of what's happening in the country, like all the people that are coming yeah. here to move. So they are kind of you can be in a situation where a uh, landlord will try to jack up the price like last minute, you know, especially when they see you and oh, you come from the United yeah, States. I yeah, said yeah. a thousand, that's 15 hours, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, it happens here. So you kind of need to learn how to uh, navigate the culture here on that side. Uh, I, I'm in San Blas. Uh, we love it here. We are on a. It good seems like school. a lot of Bitcoiners are moving there. Yeah, a lot of Bitcoin and a lot of the YouTubers like <laughs> are ending up there, uh, just because it offers a, a decent uh, lifestyle uh, of on an affordable. There's a lot of nice homes in there, but yes. it's also you can be in San Salvador in like 25, 30 minutes. So it's a uh, yeah. It's if a there's nice no traffic, yeah. If there's no traffic, if yeah. there is traffic, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> but. Yeah, so the advice that I give people is try to go to the city when you do the shopping in the big uh, uh, stores during Sunday, like on yeah. Sunday, so there's no traffic, but it's not always possible. So, yeah, that's the only thing that you need to balance. If you are, uh, if you like the city lifestyle, then 
I think San Salvador is great. If it's you a wanna, nice, I'm not a city person, but San Salvador is a nice yeah. city. I, it's not too bad. There was a little yeah. bit of a cultural shock at the beginning coming from uh, Florida, but now in, I'm in getting what, used In what to, way? What was the, the uh, things that... So we were not in the city. We were living on uh, Jacksonville on the beach. Uh -huh. So we were used to a lot of parking, nice big roads, clean, uh, no stray dogs. Uh, uh, and there's a kind of uh, a view on... Uh, on the neighbors, you know, like nice houses, single family homes. So we, we go, you go to San Salvador and it's crowded. You see yeah. uh, townhomes and uh, which can be very nice townhouses. The only problem that we found is that sometimes they don't have windows and we, we need windows. We, we check some houses and it's nice, a good size, a good price. We just need more windows. We cannot live in the dark like this. Well, I think a lot of those homes were built when things were tough here and so security was always a major component and so you will find things like that that's a good point i didn't think about that yeah and that's probably more to to that than just the, the design yeah. and architectural and big walls around them with mm -hmm. razor wire and yeah yeah so a lot of times it can look very ugly from the outside then you get inside you're like oh this mm -hmm. is quite nice so and my only advice it would be if you want to go live in the city and you want to uh, find something affordable I will live in Santa Tecla, which now is safe, and you can find some very nice spots and nice community, and you're very close to all the amenities from there, which was actually the, our second option. But then okay. we found our house on the beach, and there was there was also a little bit of a wolf factor and a happy factor in there. I say, yeah, you're going to be happier here than there. So we'll figure it out after. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love living on the beach. I mean, there's, there's drawbacks. My... My kids mm -hmm. both go to school in San Salvador, so they have to wake up at 4.30 every day and leave by 5.30 a.m. in order to be in school in time. And so there's... And here is the thing. If you homeschool like we do, it's going to be even easier to live yeah. on the beach. If you don't homeschool, you're going to have to commute because yep. there are very good schools in the city. So something that people ask me a lot, families especially, that reach out to me from Twitter because they want to move here and learn how to do it and what to do with families. Uh, I tell them like they're very good schools if you don't homeschool in uh, in San Salvador because we have done our research, of course, me and my yeah. wife. You can find a German school, the British, the American, the French one. So, very yeah, good schools. no, there's my my daughter's at the American school, my son's at the international school, okay. and they they've both been been very happy. We we homeschool them till high school, so okay. for and that was a lot easier. But once they got to high school, they both wanted to go to quote real school and so. And it was it was good for them to have that experience at that age, the social aspect and the, um, yeah, and and they were getting to the point where I was having a hard time helping them with their math, so it was good for them to. <laughs> but it was uh, yeah, it's, you definitely pay a price on the commute. Yep. Um, so so yeah, I think San Blas, where you guys are at in that area, it's it's still close to the city, but you're on the beach. It's a little bit of the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, Another good option could be Saragossa, yeah. where you also find a better climate than the beach if if you have a hard time handling the heat because uh, in during March, April, and May, May the, the now. Heat, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> like before March, actually, I have to say that the heat was fine because we came from Florida and it was not that bad. Like in Florida, you cannot stay outside. When it's hot, it's hot, <laughs> you know? But here it was manageable. On yeah. the shade, it was nice. And then March started getting hotter and hotter in April. And, and then I've learned that the closer you get to wet, uh, the rainy season, the hotter it gets and it gets more challenging. And our house doesn't even have a living room. It's all like the, the living room is all outdoor. Outdoor, yeah. Which is great because it forces us to eat outside, breathe fresh air. But it has become a little bit uh, a tough uh, challenge during this uh Heated mall. It should it should start getting better. I mean, they call it Malo Mayo, like because it's the which means bad May. Yeah. It's like the the worst month, really. And oh, yeah. then okay. in June, the the rain start becoming more consistent, and it cools things down a little okay. bit. And and then like it's it's decent. In September and October it gets really rainy. It can be cold or hot depending on on the day. And then. Uh, November through March are my favorite months. It's the dry season, but kind of cooler. And so yeah. November is also great because there is the Adopting Bitcoin yes, conference. Yes. So that's probably the best month if you need to pick one during the yeah. year to visit. November is nice because it's still a little hot in November, 
but it's on the tail end of the rainy season. So everything's green and vibrant. Mm -hmm. As far as for the weather, probably like January and February are the coolest months. So Interesting. Yeah, but yeah, November through through March are always the the time I recommend people come. Yeah, in. we are learning here. We have been here nine months so far. Okay, maybe a little bit more, but yeah, still learning. So, what did your kids think of moving here? Were they excited about it? Was it hard? Are they young enough that they didn't didn't? Uh... So they're they're little. They're five and seven. So it's not that much of a problem for them. At the same time, they have been used to move with us because we have lived, we have changed city pretty much every year <laughs> since uh, my wife and I married. Okay. First in Florida, going north and north, and then in Europe, and then coming back even north in Florida. Uh, so the, actually, when we go here, say, where are we going next? <laughs> we just got here, guys. <laughs> Relax. I don't think you're going anywhere else. <laughs> For a long time. <laughs> so what, what language do you guys speak at home? So I speak to the kids in Italian because uh -huh. I don't want them to lose it and because my mom doesn't speak any English. Okay. Uh, my wife speaks to them English and sometimes Portuguese because she is originally from Brazil. Uh, between my wife and I, we speak in uh, English. And, uh, and they're picking up some Spanish just oh, they're from everybody. Now. Oh, really? They're fluent now in Spanish. It's so much easier when you're young. So jealous. I know. Young, yeah. I'm struggling so much learning <sighs> Spanish. <It's laughs> my my kids, I mean, are completely fluent. And I'm I, I laugh that I'm like the typical immigrant parent that like we go someplace and I have to like look at them like what is it? what did they say? <laughs> you know, if they say it perfectly clear or whatever, but if it's if the person has you know, talk slow or has an accent or I'm like, uh, and they're like, come on, dad, how long have you been here? I mean, at least your kids are teens, right? I literally ask my kids five and seven, what is he saying? <laughs> Translate for me. So it's, it's even worse for me. It makes me look even worse. <laughs> uh, that's so it's so funny because I've seen you grow up in California where there's there's a lot of immigrant families. And you see that all the time with them looking to their kids. And now I'm in their shoes. So uh, Interesting. yeah, it's great. So they've i'm assuming they enjoy having the pool and being near the beach and having all that yeah they they love it here i i think el salvador is great for families our biggest concern was safety once yeah. we get over that uh, uh concern but once we uh, don't trust but verify came here see it for ourselves okay this is safe we can come with our kids and i think it's great because they're gonna be as exposed to a lot of nature if you like that for your kids, which yeah. I personally think it's good for kids. Have they started uh, surfing yet? So we did, so we do body surf, so uh -huh. they can do that. We did one surfing lesson at Hop House during uh, sur Surf Para Todos uh -huh. on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for our schedule Saturday because otherwise we would actually we take them two or three times, but then it didn't work for our schedule. Uh, but yeah, definitely I would love for them to pick up surfing. Actually, I would also like to <laughs> surf. I'm just so busy right now. <laughs> But that's a dream of mine to become uh, fluent in surfing. You know? So did you guys move down here with remote work or how? That's a question we always get from people is, hey, I, I want to move down there, but how do I sustain myself? How do I support myself? Yes, that's also a question that I get a lot. And uh, so for us personally, we are remote workers. We have a business in the United States. And my wife and I, what we do is uh, we have a podcast management agency. And that's how we pay for our expenses what, here. What does that mean? What is, What do you... So if people want to uh, launch a podcast or improve their current podcast, maybe they've launched a podcast, but they're not seeing the result that I thought they were going to get, uh, they would come to us uh, and we would help them. E either launching a podcast from scratch or improving their current podcast. Usually the problem is SEO and copywriting. Uh, what people do is they just give us the the clip, the audio clip. Uh, Sometimes it's a video clip, and mm -hmm. just we do everything else, from the editing to the copywriting, the SEO search. We put this podcast everywhere, even on Fountain, where you can get stats for okay, listening yeah. to podcasts. <laughs> well, we will have to connect offline then, because we're we're still obviously this show is is relatively new, and we're trying to fumble and figure it out as we go along. So you excited. Know, to not try to reinvent the wheel. If you guys have it dialed in, that's perfect. Definitely. And you know, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, I also listen to a lot of podcasts and Bitcoiner podcasts, of course, and I see a lot of great podcasts with great content, uh, 
that should have a lot more visibility. They are just on a, uh, the, the backhand uh, part figured out, which is challenging. It's a whole yeah. set of skills that you need to learn. So actually our dream is to start working more with Bitcoiners or people that have values that are more oriented with ours. So. Because sometimes our clients, most of our clients right now, they're not. <laughs> but that's what we Well, do. I'm assuming that they can pay you in Bitcoin then? The, yes. The, for the services? Yeah. All right. And we also give a discount if people can pay us okay. in Bitcoin. So, Sweet. Yeah, we're also trying to orange peel the current clients that we have. That is just very hard because yeah. usually these are... Uh, yeah, how, if you have clients that are outside of El Salvador, what... How do they pay you? How does that so, even happen logistically? Oh, uh, we have our we are we come from Florida. We moved here from okay, Florida. Okay, so you still have bank accounts there. Yes, we are still very well connected to the American government, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the IRS and all those uh, yeah. problems that come with it. So, yeah, we have uh, we get paid uh, in dollars in our bank okay. account. Yeah, and we transfer yeah. here. For people that don't have accounts in the U.S., a lot of times that's a big issue. Is like just trying to get paid. So that is Bitcoin true. obviously fixes that. But um, you know, when you have clients that don't want to pay in Bitcoin, it can be a little. Yeah, because you know, in the United States, a lot of people they pay with a lot of time. People pay with uh, credit cards, yeah. So they don't have, uh, you know, with the financial systems in the United States that it's about to collapse, but it's working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm the same way in the U.S. or with my business in the U.S. I put everything on a credit card because I get my you know, airline miles or my hotel points or whatever. So they, so it, it's I'm, I'm hard, part of the problem, I guess. So it's hard to bring uh, the American middle class to Bitcoin to understand yeah. it because they don't have a need. While being here in El Salvador, talking about Bitcoin, orange peeling people is a lot more rewarding because people are interested. You know? Yeah, most of the stores and businesses are never going to get qualified to accept credit cards. And so for them, also that. taking Bitcoin, it's their the really only opportunity to be connected to the global financial system. Yeah, and they can also save on fees. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to Which a business here, owner. crazy. So I was talking to a business owner last week in Tunku, and uh, they're, uh, I don't remember what bank they're using, but when a client's paying is wiping out Visa or MasterCard, they pay 4.5 or 5%. As, I've heard up to 7% for some uh, yes, of the businesses Other people here. have told me they pay to 7 to 8%. Yeah. And if you start accepting Bitcoin, you're going to, reduce a lot of those fees. So it's one of the incentives that Bitcoin brings. You know? Well, and it's crazy because I have a, a food service business in the US and you know, you're know, you lucky to be working on 20% margins in, in the food industry. If you're paying 8% of that, that's almost half of your pro profit. That's 40% yep. of your profit just going to pay the credit mm -hmm. card fees. And so for these businesses, a lot of times they don't even think about it like that because they're like, oh, it's only a few percent. But you're like, yeah, but your profit margins are only 10% or 15%. Yeah. So it's a third of your profits. Yeah, that and are I try going to, to make that, them so. think, okay, how much is this going to be one year? How much in two, five, yeah. 10 years? This is all the money that you could save if you embrace and adopt Bitcoin. And people are scared, but there is a learning curve. But when, once you get over, and today we have a lot of tools and systems to make. Uh, adoption a lot easier for people that don't understand anything about Bitcoin. Definitely. So how, what percentage of your life would you say here is lived on Bitcoin? Are you spending it regularly or? Yes, uh, I think I managed uh, really probably on a 70% Bitcoin standard. Uh, nice. Yep. And uh, it, it's very rewarding. I'm actually one of these people that is sick of the banks. And every time I have to deal with uh, my Schwab or my Choice account in Florida, I just have my blood starts boiling, you know? <laughs> it is what it is. We are trying to get 100% Bitcoin standard. It's still challenging as of now, especially with what's going on right now with all the banks collapsing, all yeah. the, the dominoes are falling. So now the challenge is we are trying to keep as minimum as possible in dollars in the United States because I know at some point they're going to freeze those accounts. We know something is going to happen. But at the same time, we have expenses there. So I can now just withdraw everything and say bye-bye to yeah. the banks. So we are managing this. And it's a little bit stressful right now. <sighs> the, for me, I we've had to send a couple wires when we bought vehicles and, and stuff. Luckily, the last vehicles we bought for the project we were able to buy with Bitcoin, which was awesome. But before mm -hmm. that, I've had to... And, it feels like you're living in the dark ages. I mean, literally, they make you go into the bank, you fill out these forms, and then it 
takes two weeks for it to get clear. They always hold it up for some reason. I mean, some random stuff. And you're like, ah, we have the solution right here. We could just make a Bitcoin transaction. But you know what's funny about what you said is that I also had that feeling going back to Florida and not having the opportunity to pay in Bitcoin. It felt so weird. Like, okay, I'm going back in time. Yep. You know, it was a, a very surreal feeling. You know, oh, I have to go to uh, an ATM to draw cash, uh, to send this money, and I need to call the bank. What is going on? <laughs> it feels like you're going back in time because here, yeah. You can just leave your house with your phone and you pay, you know, not obviously not every place takes Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but you can almost always find places that, that take Bitcoin. So you can choose and, to. And it's very easy to incentivate, uh, um, to incentivize a place or accept Bitcoin. Just offer them a little bit more or yeah. a tape. Okay, well, how, how we do this? And they will be happy to, to get extra if it's in Bitcoin, even if it's in Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, um, I think the longer you live here, the, you just kind of lose patience with the banking system. It it does work overall, but I think when you're here and you see how much better Bitcoin works, I mean, I just had to feel the call from the bank, two things of them wanting to verify why I'm sending funds here. And I think it was specifically because it was coming from uh, a, uh, a exchange where I had bought some Bitcoin. So they wanted to know why I was interacting with this exchange. And they had flagged my account and they had to do, you know, it's, it's like, no, I just want you out of my life. You know, like, that's the thing that terrifies me, having my account flagged or frozen and not having access to my money that I work so freaking hard yeah. to, to collect and to save. And uh, one of the big wake up calls for me was the trucker protest in Canada when they start freezing bank accounts or what's happening now with the bank runs in, uh, yeah. in the United States. So, and uh, I'm also one of these people that when I was shitcoining, I also got burned, you know, and I have some fun stuck on Celsius on Voyager, you know, I learned after, so we can talk <laughs> about that. And so I realized, oh, wow, if I don't take, if I don't take this money in self-custody, it's not my money. Yeah. Someone else can arbitrarily decide to freeze it, stop it, or limit the usage of it, of my money. What the hell is going on? And so these things, it's one of the things that really uh, terrifies me about the banking system and also the, one of the things that pushed me towards Bitcoin, self custody and really understand it. And uh, Yeah, I mean, they can literally just decide that you have no access to it. And the burden's on you to prove yes. you didn't do anything wrong. Yep. And you have to go through, you know, hours of being mm -hmm. on hold to try to get anybody can make a decision. And it's, ah, it's, yep. it's to me, it's insane that people still choose to use that they say oh bitcoin's too hard to use i'm like oh my gosh compared to the dealing with the banks compared, Bitcoin's easy compared to the risk that you're taking with having your money in the, not only cash dollars in the bank but if you think about every security you don't really own it the broker usually owns it or the yep. bank so you could be literally at the whim of Anybody that doesn't like you for any reason, you could yeah. be bankrupt or have your account frozen. And what do you do then? So maybe it's worth it to take a couple of hours to start to learn Bitcoin and then go deeper and deeper. And like you were saying, there's important of self-custody and actually owning the, the Bitcoin. I, unfortunately, most, most of the funds that, that I had saved for the future were in retirement accounts. And so I thought, oh, I'll just put it in GBTC and you know I'll be able to own Bitcoin. Well. Now I'm sitting on these GBTC shares that I don't have custody of and that are, you know, at 60 percent of the value of the Bitcoin they hold because of all the shenanigans going on over there. And so that was another lesson for me. It's like, wow. it's not just holding something that holds Bitcoin like you need to self custody that it, it gets a little more cumbersome when it's with retirement accounts because they they make you jump through a lot of hoops but in retrospect i wish i would have done that now i'm now i'm kind of waiting hoping that it'll come back to par value at some point but it's uh yeah i mean and the thing is that uh, when you come from the united states and you're in a overall comfortable position you don't really understand the value of something so you need a little bit of a shock or you need to uh, reach bottom or to get like scared into okay let me figure it out because Otherwise, we keep going with our lives until we don't get that wake-up call. Yeah, you're stuck in those patterns. It's it's 
interesting to see how many people are waking up though recently with the trucking thing with all these things going on i'm hearing more and more people that were very <laughs> normal average people that never made waves or did anything that wasn't safe and now they're realizing actually that's unsafe to keep relying on the banks and so I mean, I'm we're seeing of, that shift and i'm one of those people and uh, you know i'm also one of those people that i am actually grateful for covid and for what happened because who knows if it wasn't that shocking if it would have been uh, if i would have been woke up yeah and maybe i was also lucky because i decided to go in europe at the worst moment maybe if i was stayed in florida in my bubble also i would have not uh, woke up so uh, we learn from struggle that's that's the thing that i've learned thanks to covid and also thanks to bitcoin yeah. what has been like some of the surprises for you of living in el salvador both good and bad things that um and, and just how do you advise people that are thinking to move here of what things they should consider so depending on where you're coming from and if you have traveled before El Salvador especially if you have traveled to third world countries you might have a little bit of a cultural shock when you come here okay if you come from uh, Canada or the United States or Europe it's a little different uh, so what I advise people is to come here and have an open mind and understand that it's just about getting used to now Personally, the things that for me were hard to get used to at the beginning <laughs> were traffic, not only traffic, but there's also traffic in uh, Florida, but here the roads are narrow and they're not ideal. And there's still the culture of driving very, very like aggressively. And I don't know if that comes- And not waiting in line, just driving around and cutting in in front of- <laughs> Here's the thing, <laughs> there are traffic lights, there's uh, stops, there is uh, no U-turn signs, but, it's all up for interpretation yes. some of the times, you know, and I have to say that the first uh, month, uh, second month that I was here, at some point I was commuting from the beach to the city every day to take my kids to a summer camp. And every day, like almost every day, I was seeing like a car accident and people like <laughs> on the roads. OK, but I have to say that recently I've been going back to the city a lot and I don't know, I have the feeling like the traffic is getting better. Yeah. Maybe the culture about driving, they're still aggressive, but they're not crazy. But they're following the rules more, I feel like. It's yeah. not as blatant as before. So yeah, that's, that's uh, do you, are you having this feeling? Yeah, now? yeah. Um, it used to be, I mean, they would pass on blind, you know, the semi-truck would pass on a blind corner going around the curve and you'd see, and you still can see that occasionally, but it's yep. gotten a lot better. I used to get frustrated if you're waiting in line you know, traffic and people drive up the side and go around and, and, but I feel like all of that is starting to get a little bit better. Yeah. I think the traffic is getting better. The other thing uh, is maybe uh, stray animals, which it's sad to see these dogs or cats are not in yeah. ideal conditions, but it's also not ideal because sometimes they're on the roads, on the streets and they cross. So you want to be careful and uh, try to be respectful and not kill them. Uh, another thing that's interesting here to get used to is that you don't flush toilet paper down the drain here. You actually need to throw it on the side in a bucket. And uh, it was some, one of the things at the beginning that was a big surprise for us. And, oh, yeah. What is this? Why? And we learned why after. Now, I see houses that are more modern that the landlord still tells you not to do that. I don't know if they're just doing that out of what they're used to or out of an abundance of cash for their uh, plumbing systems. But I, I don't know. I, I think it's a little of both. I mean, sometimes they still will use the three inch line instead of four inch line for the, the sewer part of it. And so, you know, that's that causes, you know, there to be a lot more clogs and things if you're putting toilet paper down. And then sometimes the actual system that it's dumping into, whether it's septic or connected to a sewer system, was not set up to to handle paper. Um, but there are, I mean, I know there's homes here in El Zante that people have redone, redone the septic so that they don't have to deal with that. Um, okay. We're fixing this place right now and we're putting all, you know, the bigger pipes in and, and all of that. So, yeah, I think it's, okay. but, but culturally it is the norm. So, okay. So if you're going to build something here, make sure they use the four inches. Yeah. Pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's little things like that. That's that a very you, good yeah. uh, trick to that. Know. A lot of times they don't vent the lines here. So they're, they're more likely to, to get plugged up. So you. You know, in the U.S., or you always see there's there's 
line sticking out of your roof. That's the venting for your sinks and your toilets and all that. Okay. A lot of times here they won't do that. I think it's usually just to save on cost. And so there's there's certain things like that that are yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. The other thing, maybe a little bit negative, but I think is a cultural thing in all Latin American and third world country is that people will give you a different pricing once you do some sort of business with them. That happens often, not always, but very often. And you will just need to learn and integrate it with the culture. But have you, I, I, I'm kind of surprised because I haven't found that very much. Have you had that happen a lot? A lot. Me and okay. the old other expats that I talked really? to. Yeah, how much did you pay for that? I paid that. I paid that. I paid that. Oh, interesting. What's happening? <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, it, it's understandable. Yeah. Uh, because most of the time, uh, the locals were used to only have tourists here, not expats. They, they live here long term. So, uh, and also probably this comes from living a lifestyle where their life were in danger like every single day. So they were not thinking long term building business relationship yeah. or customer relationship. So they were trying just to get whatever they could on that day to survive. So I'm not blaming it on them. Like, yeah, it is what it is. But this happens everywhere in all third world countries. I've been in Egypt. It's even worse. Though. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, a lot of times you go and they give you some crazy price and you have to negotiate everything. In general, I haven't found that here. Um, it's also you, part of the culture here to, to negotiate for everything. They also do it. Uh, between yeah. locals, yeah, yeah. Also, but of course, when they see a gringo or a white person, yeah, this yeah, happens yeah. Also. But a little bit more. The great thing about El Salvador, and one of the the key reason for us to move here, and also for other friends of mine that are coming from Florida, is that how kind, respectful, and nice are people here. Like it is just crazy. All the situation where we asked for help. And people not only helped us, but they gave, they went above and beyond. Yeah. I'll tell you this funny story. I was looking as a, you know, as a spoiled white person from the United States, I was looking some for organic white rice, which was very challenging to find. So I was at this organic uh, veggie store in Escalon. I asked the lady and she said, oh, you know, wait a second, there is the, the owner of the store, maybe he can help you. So I go talk to the owner. I couldn't understand pretty much anything. Long story short, he sent me in the direction to check out the store, but it doesn't send me actually. It was taking me there. So yeah. he said, oh, follow me, follow, follow what? We hope on the cars and he came with me and I thought it was done. No, he came into the store and he started looking at the labels. Hey, is this, is this organic enough for you? Why the uh, spoiled person? <laughs> it, was just, it wasn't saying like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it, was just, uh, it was just funny. And, and we had many of these experiences with people just helping you. And or just being kind and respectful, even towards the kids, yeah. you know, and in Florida is very different. Even in Italy, it was very different when we were there. <laughs> no, if if I guarantee you, if I needed a dollar, I'd have an easier time finding one from somebody in El Salvador than I would in the U.S. So people yep. are very generous and helpful. That is true. Yeah, that is true. And that was uh, another great selling point for us. And uh, sadly for me, Bitcoin came only after all the lessons that I've learned. But living in El Salvador on a almost uh, Bitcoin standard cemented the belief and conviction that I have in Bitcoin. Are you able to pay for your rent in Bitcoin? That's the, the ch most challenging thing. Okay. I'm starting orange peeling my landlord. Lovely. And I would also, I would really like for him to get in there also because I don't want to keep the cash in my yeah. United States bank. So that's the last thing that I'm trying to pay in, uh, in Bitcoin. And I got him to Chivo. I showed him, showed him how it works. Uh, it's just, you know, a guy from the upper middle class here in South yeah. Florida. So you encounter the same problem that you would encounter in the United States. Ah, doesn't really care. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I think it will get there at some point. I think sometimes the selling point is just easier for them. They don't have to worry about meeting you to get get paid in cash or any of that. You can just send it directly to them. And so once they've like done a few and realized like, oh, this is easier, mm -hmm. they might not care about Bitcoin, but they like just the fact that it's easier to yeah, use. The other challenge that people have here is that, okay, how do I use it now for paying? And I tell them some stores accept it yeah. so you can just pay with this your wallet on your phone, or you can go to a Chivo ATM and withdraw cash. Now, I'm one of those uh, people that have used the Chivo ATM a lot to withdraw cash and I never had a problem. <laughs> so I tell people, of course, learn how it works first yeah. before going and dropping a lot of money if you're trying to buy Bitcoin or if you're trying to get cash 
before sending a lot of Bitcoin into it. Make sure it, you understand the process and a little bit test that out. Maybe do it on one of these Chivo location where there are uh, people working there so they can assist you. And if you have a problem, just call the call center and they will help you and they always solve the problem in my experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I rarely ever use the, the ATMs, um, but I had never had a problem up until a couple months ago. I was leaving to go somewhere and there was one in the ATM, or it was ATM in the airport. And so I was like, I'm used to being able to do things in Bitcoin here. So I'm like, okay, I better get some cash because I'm leaving El Salvador. And it wouldn't let me pull it out. It was waiting. Usually it would let me get the money. It would give it to me right away. But this time it wanted confirmations. Mm -hmm. And anyways, I had to get on my flight and deal with it when I got back. So okay. that was the that was the only issue. I have heard... A lot of horror stories mm -hmm. from other yep. people, both trying to buy Bitcoin in it and to sell it. But for me, it's always worked pretty quickly. I know we have one of the Chivo ATMs at Hope House. And so the people there have to deal with a lot of the problems. So I usually hear yeah. about those. Um, it's usually little technical things that they always get worked out over the long run, but it's it can cause some headaches. But it's, okay. you know, that's that's part of any any new endeavor. Or, and that's why it's better to not. Need There's going to be the bumps ATM. The if, you get, yeah. if you just spend Bitcoin directly, you don't have to deal with that as much. So as we get more and more with that, have you used BitRefill to pay any of your bills? I have not yet. I mean, I actually, I tested it a while ago, like a couple of weeks ago uh -huh. during the Mi Premier Bitcoin meetup. Okay. But actually, I want to start using it more. Yes. You can pay like your car insurance. You can pay... They, I was super excited because you could pay your electric bill with it. And then for a while, that option wasn't there anymore. But they just messaged me today and said that that's coming back again. So, okay. um, yeah, you can pay your electric bill. Depending on where you're at, you can pay your water bill. There's a lot of different things that, that you can pay with it. So it's, it's super handy. Um, By the way, my car insurance, I can actually pay with Bitcoin. I just have to go to the office. I don't know why they don't do it online. Yeah, I've heard that about a couple of the companies. Yeah. So, yeah. But I'm pretty impressed uh, thinking about uh, El Salvador when I just got here nine months ago and all the progress that it has done with Bitcoin payments, uh, especially also in uh, the big chains, uh, like in the big retail stores like uh, Vidri, Freund, uh, Super Selecto, even Price Smart. Now I can pay with Bitcoin. With Lightning now, finally. Without problem. Because you know? it used to be you could pay on chain, but you had the. I mean, we, wait. we've waited a couple hours before to have, because they wanted confirmations mm -hmm. before they'd let you leave. And here's so. the great thing about this country. Yeah, there are bumps on the road, but they're always uh, smoting them. They're always working on fixing yeah. things. Uh, while <laughs> if you are in other countries, good luck. <laughs> I still have kind of hit and miss with Super Select, though. So I oh, feel yeah, like okay. sometimes it works well and sometimes <laughs> it's, yeah. But. I think one of the challenges here they have is training the employees yeah. because uh, oftentimes it's the employee that is not well trained or is not confident enough. So they don't really want to use it or they'll say it doesn't work uh, or they will try to. The, the main problem with this is for a lot of businesses here, if there's a mistake made, the employee has to pay for it mm -hmm. out of their own wages. And so when you're talking about somebody who's making $15 a day, and they're processing an $80 transaction for somebody and something they're not comfortable with, it's scary to them because they're like, if this something goes wrong. And so with the Chivo wallet, they have the, the QR codes that only work with other Chivo wallets. Mm -hmm. yep. And so they think that's the only way, because most of the businesses want to convert to dollars, hopefully longer term, they'll mm -hmm. see that that's not the best way mm -hmm. to do it. But for now, but a lot of them mistakenly believe that they have to use the Chivo QR code because it has a little dollar sign in it. They can accept it as Bitcoin and automatically convert it to dollars. But mm. so a lot of times they'll they'll produce this QR code that's not a Bitcoin QR code. And you say, no, you need to do that. And they're like, no, 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 this is the only way we're going to do it. So, I mean, I had people open enough to let me show to them. Like I tell them, no, let me do it. Let me show you. And then they will do yeah. it. But I didn't know that people, if uh, if there is a mistake, uh, the employees would pay out of the yeah. pocket. That's that's not good. No, so it's that, that's it's awful. that's why they're very hesitant to do okay. anything. That that's they, very they good they don't to understand. put things in perspective and try to be even more compassionate. Yeah, with people. Yeah, yeah, because they're like, yeah. eh. so 
Um, but it, it, like you said, it just keeps getting better and better as we, as we go along. Um, it does. And everything here in El Salvador is getting better. I've been here only nine months and I am always mind blown of all the different little things that I see improving from the roads that is getting better going to the city from the lightning now or the flags. Now they're securing the, the slopes uh, next to the road because mm -hmm. it, when it, there is rainy season, or it was dangerous. It was, it was always like rocks or trees falling on the streets. And uh, recently I've been, I've been in the city center of San Salvador and I was there when I first got here and it was a mess. <laughs> it was crowded, dirty, chaotic. I didn't want to go there anymore, but I went there recently to make a video and now they have cleared up. They put all the vendors into locations where they have like a roof or like a yeah. special mold for vendors so they can also keep working when when it's rainy season so it's good for them they don't have to close shop when it starts the storm and they repainted the building and it's nice and clean and like uh, el salvador downtown city center is it's beautiful so i i have to admit i have not been down there since they because i also had been mm -hmm. down several times and i'm like i don't want to go back there it was You're gonna horrible be blown before away. I want to take my family. I can take the kids now for, for a weekend, you know, for a Sunday trip, a family trip. It's pretty impressive. Well, I've seen videos. They show these old colonial buildings. I'm like, I don't remember anything like that. I just remember like congestion yeah. and vendors everywhere. Yeah. And you're trying to drive a car down this road and you, it was you can't nightmare. even squeeze yeah. through. Oh, man. Driving there was yeah. a nightmare. No, but it, it's, it, it's just incredible how fast this country is improving. And coming from Florida or from the United States, where I felt like things were going worse every day, <laughs> every time you open Twitter or the news or you talk to other parents or at the park or with other families, things were just getting worse and worse. And then we come here and we see things getting better and better. We just wake up better every morning. We feel refreshed and our, also our entrepreneurial spirit here got such a big boost. So. I just love it. The the thing that's surprising to me is I've seen all this stuff going on and and my worry always went back to oh the government must be just spending way beyond their means and they must be acquiring a bunch of debt and how is this going to be sustainable? But it's interesting I've read a number of of analysis of the country and I can't remember if it was JP Morgan it was one of the mm -hmm. the big banks that released something uh I think it was yesterday or last week that it was saying that El Salvador has actually cut back on their spending, that they're showing a lot of restraint, that their fiscal picture is getting much better. They, mm -hmm. I think they had their bonds raised like three levels, like overnight. Yep. And so it was, it was weird to hear them. You see all this work being done, you see all this progress and them saying that they're cutting back on spending or being restrained with spending really made me excited of, wow, this is actually sustainable. They're not just spending a bunch of money that they don't have. And yet it's in the interesting thing, like they don't have the Fed printer. <laughs> the printer is in Washington, it's, uh, it's in Jekyll Island. Yep. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's with printing no money. They can't print anything. So how are they doing this? Maybe sound money works, you know? Maybe people say, oh, we need to have inflation. Sound money doesn't work. It's, oh, no, really, yeah. because look what's happening in El Salvador. So, well, I saw there was another, I think it was Bank of America put something out of several months ago, but they were saying that the tax revenue had like surged. And it was funny because before when people said they're adopting Bitcoin, oh, there's going to be, you know, all this tax avoidance and this mm -hmm. and that, but it's actually, they've unleashed the economy and they've encourage people to go out and open businesses, do things, and the country is benefiting because of that. And there's also another thing to that, is that the whole country was paying not only taxes to the government, they were also paying taxes to the gangs. Yeah. So once the government got rid of the gangs, he immediately gave a raise to everybody in the country, all the business owners got a raise. And because of the raise now, they can afford to pay taxes <laughs> to the actual government. So, and I think they're more likely to comply because they feel like they're getting something in exchange for their value taxes. Back. Yeah. Yes. Why you don't feel like that? 
in the Western world right yeah. now, in the modern countries. No, people are, are much more likely to comply with tax laws if they feel like they're actually getting something. Mm -hmm. Where in the past, they felt like, why pay taxes? It's just going to go in some bureaucrat's pocket. Yeah. And so, yeah, for me to see that all this stuff is happening, all these improvements and projects and everything's working better, and they're being you know, lauded by these financial institutions for getting their financial house in order. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and th the interesting thing is that it's getting harder and harder for the mass media, the mainstream media to lie about El Salvador. <laughs> so they keep trying though. They definitely keep trying to, but yeah, like you said, it's, there's all these positive things that, that are happening. happening. I saw you, you made a, a posted something on Twitter today that caused a little bit of a, a stir, just talking about how there's all this criticism of what's happening in El Salvador, but it's actually transforming the country and you're seeing it with your own eyes, talking to people all the time about how much better their life is. Um, so share a little bit what went in the, I think that's your post there that, uh, and it was, a, it was a long thread, people should, should yeah. go back and find it. It is a long thread. I, it took me a couple of days to write it down. How what happened is that I am also I'm a Bitcoiner and I also adopt the line of thinking: don't trust, verify. So when I moved here with my family, the first thing that I needed to make sure is that the country was safe. I'm a little bit paranoid about safety. Like I could have never moved here like 20 years ago, like you did. <laughs> could have never. Like I actually. I didn't want to go to Latin America. Like my wife had to convince me to visit El Salvador, telling me, Francis, hey, my love, I am from Brazil. There are dangerous areas and there are safe areas oh, everywhere in Latin America. There are honest people and there's criminals. So yes. there must be safe places in El Salvador too. So I said, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Let's go check it out. We need a plan B, we're desperate. I don't know what's going on with the world. We came to visit it, super safe, not a problem. And then recently I am receiving a, let's say just negative comment about my Twitter feed because people are saying, oh, you're lying. El Salvador is dangerous. Like do this and do that. So I talked to a couple of locals and this tour guide, uh, Sandy. Like they said, you need to go visit these areas she told or me, you're living oh, in a bubble right now. Or, yeah, she told yeah. me, oh, you know what? This is not true. They're lying. The gangs now are hiding. The country's safe. I can take you to where I grew up, which was a no-go zone. Yeah. Let's go. Where is that? Is it in Ilopango? So, okay. Are you sure it's safe? Because I'm, I'm still scared. I don't want to take chances. Okay. <laughs> I have two kids. I want to live my safe life, boring life. And so we decide. Okay. Let's go. Let's go with the camera. Let's see if what you're saying is right. And so I made this video. It's on my YouTube channel. We went to what used to be a no-go zone in Ilopango. I was still scared while I was walking there. And it took me some, uh, a little bit of time to get acquainted to the area, you know, because I'm still having in my mind all the horror stories. Yeah. And uh, I was walking with uh, Sandy and she would tell me this horrible story about gangs, what they would do to people, awful. And then we are on this main road and then there is a pasaje, which is when you go inside a little, a uh, uh, path that goes between these uh, buildings, this little community there. And so they used to tell me in the past, you could not go there because gang members would hide there to ambush uh, either other gang members from uh, rival gangs or people that were get lost, people that didn't, that they were not of that place. And so I was a little bit scared. Okay, I don't know if I want to <laughs> walk there. Luckily, someone just parks there, a local, like from that place and say, Okay, Tim, I was with my videographer and the tour guide. Let me ask this guy. Let's see. We, we have it on camera. And this guy tell me, no, in the past, you could have not walked there. It was dangerous. They would have made, remove your shirt to see that you don't have any tattoos or no tattoos of a rival gang. Yeah, and I asked him, but now it's safe. I can go there. Say, no, man, now you can go with no problem. And then from the distance, I see in this uh, pasaje, like a couple of kids uh, smiling, having fun playfully walking by. And then I see an old lady with eggs smiling. Okay, it must not be that bad. And so brave, uh, brave enough. And we, we went through it and Sandy would keep telling me the stories of what would happen there. And so here is the thing, you know, I wrote this thread because I need to try to cope with reality 
and manage what I'm actually hearing from the media, from other people on Twitter. I had to see it with my eyes. I had to go there, boots on the ground, and see, okay, what is the truth? Because now we cannot believe anything that comes from media. The truth is that I was with me, myself, this uh, dumb white guy <laughs> from Italy and Florida, walking in one of the most dangerous area in El Salvador, which was one of the most dangerous era in the whole world because El Salvador was considered the murder capital of the world. Yeah. Not too long For ago. many years. For, for many, many years. years. Yeah. So um, I was there. No problem. Safe. Family walking by, smiling. People waving me from their nice little cute houses. And I have to say there was also a lovely neighborhood. It was not even that bad as a neighbor, you know? And so this thread came from me trying to reason, okay, what is going on? Like, let's try to make a little bit of sense of what's happening. And let's give the benefits of the doubt of people that say that what's happening in El Salvador is bad, it's dangerous. And so that's how I have rationalized all this. You know, people say the human rights activists or mainstream media attacks El Salvador saying that El Salvador is arresting honest people. And unfortunately, they are correct. That's happening. At the same time, that's also happening in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, in Australia. And all these other countries, they have a pretty comfy situation. They're not fighting a war against gangs. At the same time, these other countries, they all have their uh, judicial, legislative, uh, executive uh, systems all in order, all well established. They have money to take care of it. While in El Salvador, a small, poor country, we are literally fighting a war against an army that was a, like one or two percent of El Salvador population was gang members. Like, just think about that. So how do you solve a problem that is so endemic uh, in the country? The current government uh, of El Salvador had to go with uh, an iron fist, maybe. Was a war, wars are messy. There are casualties, but I heard from many people, like from, I heard from three people here, because every time I'm in an Uber drive with someone new from El Salvador, I always ask them, what do you think about Bukele? What do you yeah. think what's going on? How do you feel safe, decent? I always ask them. And uh, three different people reported to me the same story, saying family member of them or of a uh, family that's their neighbor was unjustly arrested. The family managed to get in touch with the government and the person was re released with uh, two to two two to three days. Now, is that the reality for 100% of people that are wrongly arrested here? No, of course not. I'm sure there are people that are innocent that are in jail and they should not be there. I'm sure it's happening as much as I'm sure it's happening in the United States. But in the United States, if you are wrongly arrested, if you don't have tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for a good lawyer and to pay for the fees, you're not gonna get out of there. It's gonna be very challenging most of the time. Here at least a family can try to send an email directly to someone in the top of the government and maybe they'll get the person out. Um, now, of course, this was a tough situation. So we are probably picking the lesser evil. And when I talk to people, like people can go and watch the video on YouTube and they tell me their horror stories and now they are happy, they can get out at night, they can get pizza delivered in Ilopango or Soyapango, which were no goes on. They don't have to worry, kids now, they don't have to worry to do homework with the other kids, the neighbor. So I think that it's a good result so far. Yeah. I think what people who don't live here, they don't understand how dire it was and really the the they had a choice. Do they just continue to permit the, the gangs to really control large swaths of the country? Or do they go kind of with this over the top effort to clean up everybody at the same time? Because if if they tried to do it incrementally, there was more people joining the gangs than they could take off the street. So really, the only way to do it was to cut off the pipeline of young men and women that were joining the gangs by coming out in full force and making it so unappealing to join the gangs 
that young people are no longer considering it. It used to be kind of cool. If you were young, it was like, yeah, mm -hmm. if I join the gang, people will have to respect me. Mm -hmm. They'll, you know, yep. maybe I come from a poor family and I'm nobody, but if I'm part of the gang, yep. people can't say anything to me. They'll show me deference. And so a lot of them entered because of that. A lot of them were forced to enter and, you know, mm -hmm. were threatened. Yep. And so there is this continually pipeline in. They've totally cut that off because pretty much most of the gang members are in jail right now. The ones that are not are keeping their heads low. You're not having this new wave of people. And I really don't know if there was any other way to solve the, the issue. I, I really wrestle with it. I do, because I know for sure you can't come in and do a blanket campaign like that without picking up people that are innocent and guaranteed a lot of people that are still innocent are in jail. I'm, I'm glad to hear the stories you were telling, but I, I know of others that people are still mm -hmm. trying to get family members out of jail. And so um, I don't think we should ever minimize just the tragedy that, that comes from that. But it needs to be looked at in context of the tragedy that was happening here. And so I think long term, this is actually going to save tens of thousands of, of lives because it's kind of cut off that pipeline. So so that I struggle with. The other policy I struggle with is, is they rearrested a lot of people that had been in jail before and had done their time and were released. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have been rearrested just because of their past gang affiliation. I think the thinking is that most of them went back to the gangs. And so the only way to be sure was to round all these people up. But there's numerous stories of people who had turned their lives around and, and now are back in jail. But I don't know if the government could have done it any other way. I don't think we would have seen the, the drop in murder rate and really the, like I said, it cut that pipeline of new entrants off. And I don't think you could have done that incrementally. I mean, at the same time, I don't think that El Salvador has any interest in arresting innocent people. So I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think they would do it on purpose. No. So obviously it's a mistake, and I'm pretty sure that they will try to fix the mistake as soon as they can. Now, again, this is a small country that arrested like 60 or 70,000 gang members, and it's not that hard to recognize gang members. Like, I remember uh, the first or second or third months I was here, I was driving in El Salvador. I was in my car with my, my local friend I was driving at the time, and I saw this car turning around and inside the car, I see these two people and I just see it and I get this vibe and I asked my friend, those are gang members, right? And I said, yep. It's not that hard to recognize them. It's very easy. And it's not only the tattoos. Now, yeah, yeah, they're yes not and no. I, I would push back on that a little bit mm -hmm. because historically you could with the tattoos and stuff, but the gang members smartened up and realized that you, you, you couldn't do that. So. There's a lot of innocent looking, very young kids that people have pointed out. Yeah, that's the hitman or that's somebody that's in the gang. And so I think it is difficult at times, but also I think people who have turned their lives around and do have the tattoos and those things, they've been relocked up. And I, and I don't know if that's really justice being served, if, people, if they've already served their time, if they're being locked up again. And so I, I think it's okay as Bitcoiners for us to wrestle with these things, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to keep it in context of this is like a war zone. There was thousands of people losing their lives and hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were ruined by the extortion, the other things that were happening. So it's going to be a messy process. And that's one thing I think Alex Gladstein posted something on yours, uh, yeah, the government detained tens of thousands of people without due process. What, what does that mean without due process? Most of these people were on lists. They were suspected. Now, he is right in that processing these people, because they did it so abruptly and so many people, there will be people that it'll take six months for them to get their day in court. And they have done some mass sentencings and some other things that, that I find questionable. But we have to view it in the context of what life was like for people here. I've talked to people who even, who had family members that were unjustly locked up, but they're still in favor of it because they feel like overall wow. the, the benefit that comes from it 
that it's worth some of the negative externalities of I mean, this is a tough situation. And the thing is that nobody really has an answer. So every time you ask uh, Alex Gladstein the question, okay, how how should have the government done that? He doesn't have an answer. He always dodges this, this yeah. the question. Everybody does it. I also don't have an answer, honestly. How would have been a better way to do it? Here is the thing. In the thread, if fact check me, I never say that the government uh, has not detained tens of thousands of people without doing process. I don't say that. I know that's happening. Now, the pushback that, for instance, the other guy I may did is that there is a, a, a regimen exception. Uh -huh. uh, what was, how do you say it in English? There is an exception. Uh, yeah, like a state of emergency. A state of emergency. So that's the due process now. Yeah. That's the rebuttal. I don't know if it's fair to say that. I don't understand the politics or the legislature here. I don't care. Honestly, I have other things to take care yeah. of. But the thing that I really want to bring up to people is that the country is safe right now. So if that is stopping you from visiting the country, that's a mistake. Don't listen to the media. Come and check out for yourself. I was there. It's safe. Now, are all the areas 100% safe? I don't know. If my friends tell me, let's go check out the other area that is even worse than where you were, I'll go check it out and see if it's safe. I'm, I'm a curious Bitcoiner. Yeah. I want to be safe, so I want to make sure that it's safe. But I'll, I'm going to try and figure it out and report to people what it's actually here. Because as you said, if you're outside of the country and if you don't know the history of the country, if you have not lived through what happened here, like you did, for instance, it's very hard to have a balanced perspective. And maybe I also have an unbalanced perspective because I've been here only nine months. And maybe I've only heard from people, as you said, that are very happy <laughs> right now with what's happening, that they can go out of of their houses at night, they're not in locked up anymore. And the other thing that I think is interesting is that we have seen around the world government putting pretty much everywhere in uh, house arrest without due process. <laughs> so if we start putting things uh, into a different perspective, the question is, why are we attacking El Salvador with all that they've gone through where there are bigger problem to solve in places that could definitely solve their problem if they actually wanted to because yeah. they have the means economically financially techn technologically to solve those problems el salvador doesn't have these means and it seems to me that they're dealing the best they can i don't have answer i'm here to learn no and i think it's important for us to have these conversations alex and i have have had a number of conversations offline i, I consider him a good friend and, and I, I love what HRF is doing, and I think there's a lot of value, and I think there's even value to him bringing up these questions. I, I, I kind of sense that Alex feels like there's so many Bitcoiners that are just in love with Naive that he has to go to the other extreme and take this extreme position. I think it's actually counterproductive. I think it makes him lose credibility because he, he brings things up that without understanding the nuances of the situations or the realities on the ground. And so I think it's great for us to have these conversations, but I think it's good for us to be realistic. And so that's that's what I tell people. I'm like, I, I have questions about some of these things. If I were in the president's position, I would have a hard time make, I'm glad I'm not, I would have a hard time making these hard calls because if you know a decision you're making is gonna mean there's innocent people that wind up in a jail, but also other people that would have died, their lives are saved. H how do you weigh that? I'm glad I don't have to, to weigh that. I've, and I've had people say, well, it's easy for you to say because you're white and so your kids don't have to worry about, you know, your young son doesn't have to be worried about being picked up by the police and thrown in jail, which is true, it's fair. But on the other side, I also didn't have to worry about living in a neighborhood where I was in fear for my life all the time or worry about being extorted or those other things. As a, as a foreigner, you were kind of, it was kind of hands off. That was the, in general how it was here. And so I'm going to defer to the Salvadorans who were living in these circumstances and they're 92% in favor of the current policy. And so I think as, as foreigners, whether you live here or, or, or outside the country, we should defer to what the people on the ground want, especially when it's so extreme, when you have 92% of the people in favor of something, we should at least question of maybe there's something we're missing. 
That's a good point. I also, as I said, I always ask uh, Salvadorians here when I meet new people here, what do you think about it? You know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, people, most of the time, they're like a little hesitant at the beginning and then they tell you, oh no, it's great here. I don't know, maybe I asked, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 people here, only a few people told me they, they think what's happening here is bad. But then to some of these people, I talked to them like a few months after, like recently, and they're kind of giving up, oh, things are fine. I don't really know what to complain about. So yeah. they're also trying to, uh, like me probably, to understand, okay, what is happening in reality? I'm seeing this reality here, we're safe. <laughs> and uh, the media tells me something different. What do I believe? Maybe I should believe what I'm experiencing first person. Well, and the media gets it so wrong. I mean, I see these articles written by people who have never even visited El Salvador before don't understand the facts on the ground and they take bits and pieces and twist them around and and then somebody else quotes them in another article mm -hmm. and it you know 10 other articles point to that no this is proof it was printed here you're like this person's never even been to el salvador it's yeah and the thing is uh, okay what do we do at this point do we release all sixty thousand people and we do things right what is going to happen to the mother murder rate do you think is it going to go back up probably because here is the thing the government has arrested 60,000 people, right? About 60,000 people. So after this also came the result of crimes, violent crimes uh, plunging drastically. So this is working. What's the other option? What's the other solution? How do we achieve the same result in this amount of time? And as you said, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't achieve these results if you do go slowly because uh, maybe gang members are gonna get better, you, more that's, ready. Well, and that's what we saw, there'd be more people joining than they could arrest. There was no way for them yeah. to, to fight it in that way. And I think, I mean, I think we should, everybody should encourage and hope that the government's doing their best to process people, to make sure if there's people that are innocent, that, that they are released. The government's taken a, a really hard stance on they're not really looking to rehabilitate these people. They've, they've conveyed that they plan on locking a lot of them up for life. I struggle with that. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's what they have to do to really break the back of this problem. And, so and I think there's still conversations to be had. Of course, and it's important to have this conversation. And you know, like a call to action that I would dare the uh, human rights activists, Bitcoiners, to, to do is, uh, okay guys, why don't you come here visits and instead of being so negative about the results that the country is taking since you're also bitcoiner why don't you get a line of communication with the government and help actually the government solve this problem because i'm sure they would love the help because they have no interest in arresting innocent people yeah why would they do they don't gain anything while in the united states there's some money to be made arresting people it's a little different yeah so <laughs> yeah, they don't have the uh, industrial prison complex mm -hmm. here. Um, but no, I, I think it's like, I'm, I'm glad that there's people like Alex calling things out. I, mm -hmm. I wish he would dig a little deeper. I, I think he would have more credibility if he was more nuanced and, and understood the situation better. But I, I think it's important for us to have these conversations. I, I think it's okay to question like, okay, you have a president that's running for a second term where historically that hasn't been allowed. Personally, I think holding people to one term encourages short-term thinking. So I, I like their being able to be a, a 10 year period that people can run, but it's, it's fair to say, hey, maybe this somebody that wants to stay in power for life. It's, it's good to have those conversations, but to realize how much good and how many great things have been happening now versus when they quote had democracy and they had presidents that were just looting the country one after another. I mean, that is a whole another rabbit hole, <laughs> you know, democracy. What is democracy? Yeah. We have seen that democracy doesn't exist during COVID. So I'm kind of shocked that some Bitcoiners have still not uh, opened up their eyes to the reality of democracy, which yeah. is nothing else than the tyranny of the majority. Oh, look at Canada, look at Australia, look at, look at Germany, all Italy, these places, New Zealand. Yeah. Like I've seen the clips of people beaten up and it was awful. So what's democracy and do is, does democracy really work? I don't know. Maybe it does at the beginning, but then when the government gets too big, maybe yeah. it becomes a problem. 
So maybe here we are going in reverse thanks to Bitcoin. Maybe the government is trying to get big fast, solve the problem, and maybe the Bitcoin, the incentives that Bitcoin creates will actually uh, disentangle, detangle, disentangle the, the government from society. So I don't know what's going to happen. It's and, and we've seen that even with their way they approached COVID. I think the fact that they had adopted Bitcoin made them be one of the first ones to open back up, to get rid of the restrictions, because I, I think a lot of it was like they know that they need Bitcoiners on their side. And so they have to roll out, you know, different programs and, and have regulations that are going to be in line with people who value freedom. You know, I have a question for you because I'm a very skeptical person. So if I don't see it with my eyes, I don't believe it. But I had two different uh, Salvadorians friends that told me that the lockdown was very harsh here. But uh, after they uh, undo the lockdown, Bukele actually apologized to the country. Two different people told me the same story. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if you know anything about it. I can't find the clip. Yeah, I don't think there was ever an apology. There was a a reversal and a and a very like reasonable facts based approach. But mm -hmm. yeah, the initial lockdown was very harsh. Uh, I was we were living here at the time, and it was it was kind of eerie. I mean, we were basically in house arrest. I'm, I was glad to be in El Zante where we have a, a pool and a big yard and stuff. I would have hated being in an apartment, but you couldn't even go to the beach. Mm -hmm. It was, and so we wound up leaving and went back to California and California was very, was much more open than it was here. Wow. So that tells you something. Um, and they completely locked the borders down. There was, I mean, my, my kids had friends, parents that were like in Miami for the weekend shopping or something. And, and couldn't get back into the country for like five months. And so they were locked away from their family. So they they went at it very harsh, but I think there was like a switch and they realized, okay, this isn't working. This isn't the rational way. And rather than doubling down, they reversed things. They were one of the first countries to open up. That's why tourism has, has boomed here. They got rid of the the vaccine and or testing requirements, right? They never had a vaccine requirement, but initially, if you had the vaccine, you didn't need to get tested. Mm. But then they got rid of requiring the testing at all in the middle of the Bitcoin conference. So I think that was part of it. I think they were having people get held so up. So Bitcoin immigration. is helping directly Bitcoin is fixing or indirectly. This. Yeah. yeah, and I also saw an advertising where the government was inciting, uh, like. Uh, telling people to be healthy, yeah. jogging, get vitamin D, get sun, be get outside. outside. Eat, eat healthy. Yes. Well, common sense. What is happening? Not about stay in your house, depress yourself, uh, get uh, experimental medicines. No, oh, wow. It's yeah. No, it was an amazing video coming from a government. I was like, it was pretty incredible. Common this sense. This would never happen in Europe or the US. They were still, you know, telling people to hunker down in their houses. They were like, hey, be healthy, be smart. So, and I think that that's why El Salvador did so well through the COVID thing. When they opened back up, there was all these dire predictions. No, they're opening up. COVID's still here. Everybody's going to die. And it was like, no, actually, you didn't really hear hardly anything of it. And so it was, they, I think they did seen, very well through the whole. I think I've seen a, a post or an article about El Salvador being the country in Latin America with the uh, least amount of death because of COVID, the lowest amount the lowest of death. Amount. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not I'm sure on that. Week, okay. Yeah. So that was I would say anecdotally, I mean, there was for sure people that, that died here, that, but it, it seemed much less than like the US. And what was interesting, I don't have any like facts or figures to back this up, but mm. what I saw on the ground was the people that, that did die were people that were living in the city that were sequestering themselves, that were hunkered down. And it was mostly people in San Salvador, the people that lived in the countryside that never really stopped doing anything because they didn't, they couldn't, they had to go out and work in their fields and do those things. The people here on the beach in El Salvador, like in El Zante in this area, they, I don't know of, of anybody that, that passed away in El Zante from, from COVID. So it was, it was interesting to see that it was actually the people that were going about their lives Getting sun, getting exercise, were much healthier than those that, you know, were scared and hunkered down in their basements. Yeah, ordering fast food uh, yeah. from McDonald's and being depressed because they could not see their families. Well, it's, it's crazy because you look at all the, 
prior to COVID, there's all kinds of studies that show if you're lonely, you're more likely to be depressed. And if you're depressed, you're much more likely to die from any cause, whether you're sick or not. You're like, chances of dying if you're lonely and depressed are like twice in all circumstances. So it doubles your chance of death. So what do we do when, when the sickness hits? We make people lonely and depressed. Yeah, let's destroy it's everybody like, immune system, right? Uh, in, insane. But but that's that's a longer uh, discussion. Let's not let's let's focus on the positive here. Um, yes. What would you tell people that are thinking about coming to El Salvador right now to to move? Would you tell them to come visit first, or just sell everything and move here, or what's what do you usually advise people? So, if you have the opportunity to come visit first, I think it's better. But many people came here just dropping everything in their own country and coming here out of the blue. So that's also possible. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked at the number of people that tell me that. They, that's they've yeah. never even been to Latin America before, but they just yes. sold everything and moved here. I mean, here's the thing. If I did it, everybody can do it. Now, the, the ideal situation is to have a remote job that pays you like uh, North American wages. So you can be fine here or have a business, a remote business, or to come here to start a business. Yeah. Because if you come here to look for employment, uh, I think it's gonna be challenging because the wages here are still the ones of a third world country. Yeah. Now, I'm sure the economy will blow up and in probably around five years, this country's wages are gonna be more comparable to countries like uh, Singapore or Hong Kong, but we are not there yet. <laughs> it's but the business opportunities I think are, I think the, there's, way more business opportunities here than there are anywhere else in the world right now. This is literally a country that is being developed right now. So any single industry here can be improved. Uh, I can't think of any industry that they can say, oh no, that's done. Good luck uh, com competing in there. Like here, everything from maybe food, uh, real estate, uh, constructions, everything here, you can come here and build a business around it or even plumbing <laughs> or uh, uh, if you're a handyman, for yeah. instance, I was talking to a guy that is a handyman a while ago. I said, I'm an employee here. Well, I don't have a remote job. I work with my hands. What can I do? Come here, start a business, hire locals, teach them how to fix things up to American standards and cater to all the experts here that are a lot. Yeah, these people paid a decent wage fix house it well once, yeah. <laughs> which people are, especially experts, are going to be very happy with. Uh, you have it right there, business opportunity. There's all sort of things that can be built here. No, I've told people even like, start a painting company that <laughs> tapes off everything and doesn't get paint everywhere because that's, you hear from a lot of expats that complain because for Salvadorans, a lot of them, it's like, hey, the paint's just there to protect stuff. If it splashes everywhere, that doesn't bother them. But expats, tend to like things tidy. And so I've known a number of expats that I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing now? I'm painting my house. Why are you painting your house? You can pay somebody, you know, 20 bucks to paint it. They're like, yeah, but the, it'll make such a mess. And so I'm like, you make like $200 an hour and you're like spending your time painting your house. I'm like, so a painting company that actually did all those things could charge twice as much as anybody else. And they'd have a ton of business, just those little things. Yep. And a lot of times as an expat, you you see things that maybe locals won't, but then you can hire or partner or team up with locals and it, yep. it helps everybody. Yeah, which is one of the advices that I give to people. A lot of business owners reach out to me, ask me for a business idea or what to do. And I would say, yeah, if you can partner with a local, it's better because it's gonna help you with the network here and yeah. it's gonna help you understanding the culture and integrating and developing the business. And the other thing would be that you can think outside of the box here because there's so much that needs to be done mm -hmm. that we might think, oh, painting company or a, a handyman, like a, someone to go and fix houses. It's what, do I, what do I do with it? And there's an opportunity in everything. Even for instance, uh, real estate here. It's very challenging to find places remotely or digitally. You want to be here, boots on the ground, network, talk to people, because for instance, the develop the real estate industry is not very well developed. 
not only technically but also culturally yeah. like here everybody has pocket listings that's how it works <laughs> so it's very hard to find uh, real estate unless you're here and start making these connections definitely no it's it's like you said there's all these opportunities that would have a ton of competition to try to do things in the u.s or europe but here it's very wide open yeah. and and it benefits the locals because you bring them into that and provide them the opportunities to partners or the opportunities to make more wages and so it's really a win-win yeah because the good thing is that you would bring here skills that you can teach the locals so the locals can get higher paid jobs at the, so and this improves their life yeah. at the same time we are still building so you are still in the phase of uh, uh this country is still in a startup phase so you can establish your business before it gets too competitive so you also can have a first mover advantage on any sort of endeavor that you would like to uh, endure here yeah so i think this is the new land of opportunities not the united states like good luck uh, trying to open a restaurant in uh, florida <laughs> Be between regulations and taxes and fees that you have to pay here is the opposite yeah. here and the government i feel like it it is trying to incentivize people to come here some start businesses and help build the economy they did it recently with the legislation to uh, cut taxes on innovation technology mm -hmm. and this industry yeah there's incentives for tourism industry there's incentives for mm -hmm. the tech and innovation they have all these different programs and they they want to see stuff in, in the u.s a lot of times i feel like the government's job is to tell you why you can't do things here i feel like they want to you know they want you to follow the rules they want you to be in compliance but they actually want you to do business to actually do it. yeah actually yesterday i was on a call with uh, almost two hours with a lady that wants to come here from florida escaping the united states and she wants to start here her dream school <laughs> She wants to do it on the beach and she was asking me do you think there is an opportunity do you think it makes sense do you think it's a good idea i said yes it's a great idea not only because there are a lot of experts here that uh, don't want to drive maybe to, to the city anymore yeah. or uh, uh, because they don't want to homeschool if you come here it's not going to be easy there's going to be challenges it's going to be a process but you can make it happen so you have a dream business that you want to build up and you can't in your country because it's too expenses expensive or there is a red carpet that you need to cross and it never ends uh, you can come to el salvador no i definitely think i have a business in the us and and i'm in the process of getting out of that business because it's just horrible trying to do especially in california where we're at but i just see i mean i see so much opportunity here it's uh yep. yeah yeah I, I, I'm the type of person that always likes to start new things. My wife's like, hey, 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 we got enough on our plate. Don't start anything new. But I'm like, oh, there's, we can do this, we can do that. There's all these great opportunities. Yeah. So. That's also maybe a problem that I have to hear that I need to kind of focus and think about one thing because there's so many opportunities. I want to jump on all of them and I can't. I have a limited yeah. amount of time as well. So, okay, let me focus my energy on this right now or on this. So that's the challenge here. It's actually the opposite of what you would find in the United States or Europe. So, so speaking of that, tell the, the viewers about your, your channel and what you guys are doing with your videos and kind of what the idea behind that is. And I don't know if you see this long term as a business or if it's just like a passion project for you or so. And also let them know where they can find it, of course. OK, so you can find me at Money Delix is my handle everywhere on Twitter, YouTube, where I'm the most active, but I'm also on other social media. And what happened is that at the beginning the channel was a passion project because i was just really enjoying being in el salvador and sharing this reality that for me was just just incredible and i want to show to other people you know when you're excited about something you want everybody yeah. hey guys yeah, yeah. have this come over here it's fantastic yeah and you're like oh you're crazy what are you doing <laughs> and uh, then with time it's becoming now more and more of a motivational thing for myself because I'm getting so sick of the lies and uh, I'm trying to report what is happening here <laughs> and uh, for myself and also for other people. So of course uh, I need to, I have a limited amount of time. So I'm trying to figure out how to turn this into a business so that I can do something that I love <laughs> talking about El Salvador, yeah. the truth, talking about Bitcoin, orange peeling people, uh, which is something that I love. 
do it um, in the end I'm using mostly YouTube and Twitter. So on YouTube, I make videos and now I'm reporting on what's happening here or I'm having conversation with other people here, kind of like you're doing to show the reality of El Salvador. On my Twitter, I go more in depth on maybe more philosophical topics or things that need to be rationalized and talk a little bit more deeply. Have you, and, and I'm gonna understand the logistics of how it's gonna work or how they're gonna do it, but I was kind of surprised with the announcement um, a few days ago from Tucker Carlson that he's going to come back and do videos, but on Twitter. So I don't know if Twitter has a new platform or if they're just gonna literally just post them on Twitter, but I've been thinking about that too, because hey, maybe that's a better place to start posting our podcast so, or how, to, I don't know if you've thought about that yet. Yeah, so, um, okay, I'm gonna put on my marketer <laughs> cap and, you know how in the past we were always looking for the new next big uh, social media platform to be the first and blow up the audience. I think the next new platform is Twitter. And what's happening is that Elon Musk, like it or not, whatever you think about Elon Musk, has a track record of accomplishing what he set up to yeah. do. And so his goal with Twitter is to go and compete directly with YouTube, with Substack, with uh, TikTok, with everything. He wants to turn Twitter in the in X, the everything app, which that's another rabbit hole of uh, problems that can come from it. But as of now, uh, yes, what it's gonna do is uh, it's gonna start sharing a revenue from ads with the content creators, kind of like YouTube does. Now it's gonna do it's gonna start only from the threads that you from the posts that you make mm -hmm. on Twitter, and I'm sure in the future. You will be able to post a long format video. Actually, I think it's, it's already possible. They're rolling it out slowly. So you can actually post right now along, uh, if you have the blue check mark and if you have been approved, you can post a long format video. Do you think they'll have a separate place for people to find that? Because a lot of times, I mean, I post on Twitter quite a bit. So if I post a video, it's going to get buried in my feed. I don't know I'm, how, I'm curious to how they're going to do it. I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think they are gonna make it uh, as uh, easy as possible for people to be addicted and yeah. stay on Twitter and consume the content as long as possible because that's the business model of social media platform so that they can sell you advertising. And uh, yeah, the other thing that now you can do on Twitter, you can apply for having membership so people can uh, follow, uh, you know, like they do on Patreon, you can have a paywall okay. on some content. Now, slowly, slowly, they're rolling this out also for Twitter. So yeah, I'm trying to, think way of monetizing my content, but I don't really want to put a paywall. So I'm, what is working right now a little bit is relying on people sending me donations and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, it feels rewarding you yeah. know, because I'm yeah, yeah. talking about what I want to talk and people send me donation or they book calls with me to talk about what's going on in El Salvador. And you know, the, I think it was Confucio saying, if you love uh, the, the job you do, your work, you won't work at the end of life. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do here in El Salvador, do what I like and getting rewarded with, and also align that with my ethics and my belief system as a Bitcoiner right now. Yeah. So if if there's people thinking about moving here, they can book a call with you mm -hmm. and and... Yep. Do you have a set fee that you charge or is it by donation? Or yeah, how some that... people do it by donation. Some okay. people want to make sure to reserve my time. Okay. So they, 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 they yeah. Pay. No, awesome. I, yeah. I would definitely recommend people, if you're thinking about moving here, it'd be well worth your money and time to, and you know, to the, book something with you. The other thing that I say to people is that a lot of things we cannot talk publicly about. Yeah. You know, we are still in the crazy era of COVID. So uh, for other topics that maybe they might be more delicate or sensitive. I talk about these things, but only in private. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if I'm happy to help, I'm helping everybody, even people that uh, don't pay me or cannot pay me. Of course, I my time is limited, so I'm giving yeah. priority yeah, to yeah. people that I can donate. And I don't know if you have heard of Vida. No. It's a lightning app that, uh, are you familiar with the link tree? Yeah, it's like you can create a quick page where you can put all your links, referrals, yeah. you know, if you do referral marketing. Vida is like a link tree on steroids. It's built on lightning and people can message you or call you directly on Vida and you can set up a fee for every message that you receive. Okay. So that's how people are messaging me and supporting me at the same time. 
Nice, nice. Yeah, and it was energy yeah, for music. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. great. I'll have to check that out. And um, yeah. And then people who want to connect with you or your wife about the, if they have a podcast that they're looking to get more traction with, just, just contact you through Twitter or what's yes. the... So as I was saying, we want to align our work with our passions and our mission in life. So our dream is to work with more Bitcoiners or freedom-loving, freedom-oriented yeah. people. So what I tell people, if you want to launch a podcast, uh, reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Twitter. It probably is the easiest way. And we can show you what's our process and how we can help you. If you have a Bitcoin podcast and it's not taking off for some reason, but you think the content is great, and I know some of this podcast, reach out to us because there's a whole backhand to do on uh, podcasting with copywriting and SEO that it boosts the ranking for the podcast uh, and the visibility of the podcast a lot. And my wife, she has a top 1% podcast on Apple. She ranks top 1%. Really? So she managed to figure out some strategies yeah. even out of the box to get this uh, podcast ranking, you know? Nice. <laughs> so, well, hopefully you guys will get some uh, contacts uh, on that also. Yeah, for sure. Any, any other place people can uh, reach out to you or any other things you want to promote? Yes. A very important and useful place to reach out to me and also to connect with the, the community of expats here in El Salvador are my groups. I have one group on Facebook and one group on Telegram. The name of both groups is Bitcoiners in El Salvador. Uh, you can also find the link on my Twitter profile or on my website. You can find everything. And uh, the group also started because I was kind of a little bit uh, frustrated with other groups that they were not you know, very honest about El Salvador. Yeah. So said, okay, screw it. I'm going to start my own group. I don't want to have a headache every yeah. time I talk to something about Bitcoin or the government. And no, the, the expat El Salvador <laughs> yeah. Facebook group there. They, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> and, and I understand they, they were getting inundated with scammers who were saying mm -hmm. like that they could help them with their Bitcoin trading and stuff like that. But yeah. it got to where they just had a blanket. Like if you mentioned Bitcoin, they would, they would block your post. So I, I actually corresponded with a few of them like hey i've been here for 20 years these are valuable things for people living in el salvador to know you can't just blanket but yeah. but i understand your frustration yeah and so i started the other group and yeah it, like in uh, well I'll, I'll have to uh I'll have to join those groups yeah so. and uh you know it's hard for me to keep up now because the group uh, grew up a lot yeah but the conversation that are in the groups are great and the feedback that them that I'm getting for people telling me, hey, thank you for the group. I was able to find a, a rental or a driver or a little house. I was able to fix a problem with Chivo or, and oh, wow. Like it's, I'm really loving doing this and I love El Salvador. You know, I wake up here and now I'm aligning my work, my life, my time. I'm investing my time in doing things that I love and it's, it's just amazing. So, you know what I say, people, I used to be a real estate agent in Florida. Now, I could never sell a house in Florida or in the United States. I said, get out of there. But here, <laughs> here, I would say people, yeah, come here, rent, buy a house, go for it, you know, because I love the product, whatever it's El Salvador or Bitcoin, and I'm confident in uh, referring or uh, suggesting the product. So. Awesome. Well, I think that's, that's a good note to, to wrap on. I appreciate your, your time, and we'll have to uh, have your wife come next time and we can get both of you on. That would be funny. I'm sure she would have, uh, she would enjoy having a conversation with you and target or address the a woman audience that wants to come here. Definitely. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it.